Well, good morning. I see most of you survived that win last night. That was unbelievable, wasn't it? You know, several years ago when we lived in Arkansas, uh, my son Josh invited several fifth grade friends over to the house to shoot baskets out on our driveway one afternoon, on a Saturday afternoon. And they seemed to be having a pretty good time when suddenly I realized an argument had broken out. So I went out on the front porch to see what was going on, just in time to hear my son Josh say, He can too! He can too! My dad can beat all the Arkansas Razorbacks in basketball! (laughs) You tell him, Josh, I went right back inside. You know, if you've raised sons, then you realize a common refrain among elementary age boys is uh, the argument, my dad's better than your dad. My dad's bigger than your dad. My dad's faster than your dad. My dad's smarter, stronger, taller, richer, got more hair than your dad. Now, as strange as that might sound, that's the sort of thing that's going on in Exodus chapter 9. You see, after Moses has told Pharaoh, let my people go, an argument of sorts breaks out between Pharaoh and Moses. Only they're not arguing about their dads. They're arguing about their gods. And the God of Moses has been more than happy to introduce himself to Pharaoh through any number of attention-getting miracles, remember? I mean, he turned the water of the Nile into blood. He sent slimy frogs to invade the land. There there were clouds of pesky gnats and swarms of biting um, flies that invaded. I mean, and with every one of those plagues, Pharaoh hardens his heart, refuses to let Israel go. And what looks like a setback for Israel is really a setup for God to show His patience toward Pharaoh and His power to the nation of Israel. In fact, God is not interested in proving to Pharaoh that he is stronger, smarter, wiser, taller than the gods of Egypt. He wants Pharaoh to understand that he is the only true God. Now, we've got to remember that the people of Egypt are rather superstitious. Uh, there are over a hundred different gods in the Egyptian pantheon of gods, each one having jurisdiction over certain aspects uh, of life in Egypt. And we've discovered in this study that God has aimed His plagues at proving the impotence of specific Egyptian gods. So when we come to Exodus 9 and discover that God sends disease on the livestock, I mean, you've got to ask the question, what is He really aiming at? Well, if you turn there to Exodus chapter 9, beginning in verse 1, we'll find out together. Notice it begins this way, and it says, And then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and tell him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let them go and still hold them, behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the field, on the horses, on the donkeys, on the camels, on the oxen, and on the sheep, a very severe pestilence. And the Lord will make a difference between the livestock of Israel and the livestock of Egypt. So nothing shall die of all that belongs to the children of Israel. Now, you probably notice as the plagues have progressed, uh, they have increased with intensity. I mean, the the first three end up being a convenience. Uh, the next three, well, they're annoyance. Uh, the next three will end up being costly. And the last plague, it'll be devastating. Now, we don't know what the severe pestilence was. It's probably some kind of disease that could only uh, infect livestock and not human beings. But it's pretty obvious that this plague would touch Egypt where it hurts. I mean, their economy. 
I mean, how would you like to lose all your livestock? Uh, oxen and um, donkeys, they were used for heavy lifting there in Egypt. Uh, for transportation, there were the camels and the horses. And, and then, of course, the cows, they delivered milk. Notice what happens next in verse 5. And then the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. And so the Lord did this thing on the next day, and all the livestock of Egypt died, but the livestock of the children of Israel, not one died. Uh, So the livestock owned by the Egyptians that were left in the field, they all died, they all perished, but those that were owned by Israel, they prospered. But the question I have is why focus a plague on destroying innocent farm animals of all things? Well, a little research will reveal that uh, one of the most uh, popular gods in the Egyptian pantheon was named Ptah, P-T-A-H. He was considered to be the creator of the universe, and he would lead Egyptians through the afterlife, Ptah. And his image on the earth was the symbol of the, the, uh, a bull. It was known as Apis, the bull. So you could call Ptah the bull god. And his tradition has it, uh, Apis was conceived in a lightning bolt, which was really Ptah mating with a heifer of all things. So um, Apis was not immortal. And when Apis, this bull, would die, another Apis would be conceived in the same manner. And, And the old Apis would be taken and embalmed and entombed in the city of Memphis, right next to Elvis. No, we're not talking Memphis, Tennessee. This is Memphis, Egypt. In fact, many um, uh, archaeological digs in Memphis have revealed uh, mummified bulls, which were the symbol of Ptah, the bull god. But there was also a goddess, a goddess named Hathor. Now, Hathor was the goddess of beauty and joy, dance. In music, she was considered the goddess of motherhood. So you can imagine she was quite popular among Egyptians. And the image of Hathor, notice her horns there. Her image on earth was the symbol of the cow. You could call Hathor the cow goddess. And what's interesting, in 1906, in an archaeological dig... They unearthed a statue of Hathor. There she is. But if you look carefully, tucked under her chin is a statue of Amenhotep II. He was considered the Pharaoh of the Exodus. And he's tucked under her chin as a way, as a way of symbolizing his submission to the goddess Hathor. Uh, another um, statue was unearthed at, at, an, at another site that had Amenhotep II drinking milk from Hathor's udder. So it becomes pretty obvious that this plague is not just aimed at Egypt's economy. It's aimed at proving the impotence of two of Egypt's favored gods, the cow goddess and the bull goddess. Now, what's interesting is if you were to fast forward, uh, say three months, you'd find yourself in Exodus 32. In that chapter, you discover that uh, the nation of Israel is at the foot of Mount Sinai. Moses has gone up the mountain to talk with God, but he's delayed in coming back down. The people grow nervous. Now, remember, they approached Moses' brother, Aaron. They say, we think Moses is dead. He's not coming back. We need a God to worship. You remember what Aaron does? He collects all their gold, melts it down, and forms it into a golden calf. Now, what's fascinating is the word calf in Hebrew used in Exodus 32 is actually the word for young bull. 
Do you see what's going on there? After all that God has done to prove His superiority over Egyptian gods, well, Israel returns the favor by returning to Ptah worship. No wonder God is so angry. Some habits, they die hard. So, what is Pharaoh's response to the fact that Ptah and Hathor are proven impotent before Israel's God? Well, look at verse 7. It says, But the heart of Pharaoh becomes hard, and he did not let the people go. So Pharaoh does what he's done the past four times. He hardens his heart. Now, several weeks ago, while I was speaking in Dallas, I met a man who had the roughest, most calloused hands I have ever shook in my life. In fact, I asked him, I said, what do you do for a living? He said, well, son, I'm a rancher. You see, the the hardness of life, the exposure to the elements had just hardened and calloused his hands. I mean, it was like, like touching a piece of leather. You know, if we're not careful... The same thing can happen to our hearts. Do you know there are a number of things you can do that can cause your heart to be callous toward God, be hard toward God? Uh, Maybe it's the confusion of life, living in this sin-cursed world. Uh, I mean, it, it has a way of wearing us down and it impacts our hearts. Uh, unanswered prayer, misinterpreting unanswered prayer, or maybe the silence of God has a way of leaving us vulnerable so that we come to the conclusion God is not listening or what is worse, He doesn't care. But maybe for you, it's been the disappointment with God. You thought He would protect you from the pain, the hurt, this person, this situation, but He didn't. And how we respond to those things will impact the tenderness of our hearts. That's why in Proverbs 4, it says, Solomon says, Keep your hearts with all diligence, for out of, out of it flow the issues of life. You know, over the years, one of the things I've began learning to help me keep my heart tender toward God is to invite Jesus into the confusion, into the disappointment of what I might be feeling. I mean, two years ago, I fell down a set of stairs and tore my quad tendon. And then a month later, the same thing happened again. I tore it twice. I had to endure three surgeries that year. You talk about confusion and disappointment. Or just three weeks ago, uh, Patty had a full-blown obstruction. We thought she was going to have to go to the hospital. The problem was I was stuck in Chicago and couldn't get home in time. And so I've learned in those situations to invite Jesus into the disappointment. In other words, ask Him to help you interpret what's going on there. Now, I seriously doubt disappointment and confusion are at the root of Pharaoh's problem, his hardness of heart. A pride or or arrogance or perhaps sin or other reasons why our hearts grow callous toward God. And Pharaoh here in the text, his hardened heart has blinded him to the truth about God. So God sends a sixth plague. But this time, he doesn't give Pharaoh warning. Look at verse 8. And so the Lord said to Moses, take for yourself handfuls of ash from the furnace. And scatter it toward the heavens, and it'll become fine dust in all the land of Egypt, and it'll cause boils that break out in sores, O man and beast, throughout the land of Egypt. And then they took ashes from the furnace and stood before Pharaoh and Moses, scattered them toward the heaven, and they caused boils that break out in sores. Now, strange as it might seem, God doesn't give Pharaoh any prior warning. He just tells Moses, I want you to go to the furnace. And I want you to get a handful of ashes. And I want you to throw it into the air. And as those ashes begin to settle, 
wherever they settled, an epidemic of boils broke out. And the Scripture says it took place on man and beast. Now, what else is interesting about this text is that the Hebrew language is rather picturesque. The word translated boils in our text literally means in Hebrews deep ulcers oozing pus. pus. That's what it means. And notice that Pharaoh's magicians are not even immune to this. Verse 11, it says, And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils were on the magicians and on all the Egyptians. Now, if you've ever had an open sore that got infected, you know some of what the Egyptians were going through. In fact, I remember a number of years ago, I was working on my doctoral degree, attending summer classes uh, in the program in Minneapolis, Minnesota, away from home, when I developed a sore on the back of my leg. Now, I was away from home, and so I went to the drugstore to get whatever I could to take care of the sore in hopes that it would go away. But as time progressed, it continued to get bigger and larger and more painful. Nothing seemed to work. In fact, it got so bad that I couldn't sit down in class to take notes. I'd have to stand up in the back to take notes. And then it got so painful, it hurt to stand up. It hurt to walk. I had to go hunt down a doctor in St. Paul, Minnesota, one afternoon because it was so painful to look for help. And he just cut it open and allowed it to drain. I mean, that was just one sore. Can you imagine being covered from head to toe with sores like the guy on the screen? I mean, no wonder the magicians couldn't even stand before Moses. You know, what is really fascinating about this situation is, did you realize that when God commands Moses to take the ashes and throw them in the the air, he was asking him to mimic the actions of the Egyptian priests? You see, the Egyptian sky goddess called Nuit, N-U-I-T, many times pronounced nut. I like to call her the nut goddess. Well, she was attributed with bestowing blessings from the atmosphere. And at certain times during the year, the Egyptian priest would commemorate what she had done by throwing ashes into the air. But now that which was a blessing to the Egyptians had now become a curse to them. And so boils broke out on everyone, and it became obvious that the nut goddess was not going to help them. And what is obvious is that the Egyptians would immediately run to Isis. She was the goddess of healing. Or to Amenhotep. Now, you've heard of him from the movie The Mummy. He was the god of medicine. But to no avail... Nothing they did could heal the boils. So you can imagine the deep despair and the frustration the Egyptians were feeling. And what else is intriguing about this passage? Is that in order for an Egyptian priest to serve in the temple, he uh, had to be inspected and declared clean. If there was a sore, a blister, Uh, uh, something that was open on his skin, he would have to be declared unclean and unfit for service. So with this one, this one plague, God shuts down all false worship across Egypt and there's nothing that Nut, Iamotep, or Isis can do about it. So how does Pharaoh respond to this plague? Well, look at verse 12. It says, But the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not heed them, just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Now, in the previous chapters, you might remember, Pharaoh hardens his heart toward God. But here, notice it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, does that seem fair to you? That God would harden his heart and then hold him accountable for his hard-heartedness? But what you need to know is in the Hebrew, there are two different words for harden. Uh, the one used in the previous chapters when it says Pharaoh hardens his own heart is the Hebrew word kablade. It means to make heavy or unresponsive. In other words, Pharaoh is making his own heart unresponsive to God. 
But the word used in this verse is the word kazak, meaning to firm or to strengthen what is already there. I mean, when the Bible says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, it's simply saying that God facilitated a process that Pharaoh had already initiated. In fact, uh, when a person begins ignoring God's promptings time and time again in his life, sometimes God steps into that situation and firms up that decision, strengthens that person's resolve so as to clarify for the individual the direction he's headed. And so when it says that uh, God hardens Pharaoh's heart, he's simply confirming the direction Pharaoh's heart has already taken him. So God sent disease to the livestock. He sends boils to the people. But lastly, notice, He sends hail on the land. Verse 13. And then the Lord said to Moses, Arise early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For at this time I will send all my plagues to your very heart, that you may know there is none like me in all the earth. But indeed, for this purpose, I've raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Now, it's right here that God lets Pharaoh in on a little secret. It's something that we've been privy to all along, and that is that the afflictions you and your fellow Egyptians are suffering with have a twofold purpose. Uh, The first thing he says that these plagues actually are an assault on the arrogance of Pharaoh's heart. Notice how he puts it. I'll send my plagues to your very heart that you may know there is none like me. You know, if there's anything that keeps us from seeing life accurately, it's our arrogance, our pride. I mean, our pride, it'll blind us to our faults. It'll force us to make excuses. It'll keep us from seeing life the way it really is. It's pride that will cause a man to refuse to admit that he's wrong to his wife and seek her forgiveness. It's pride that causes us to think of ourselves, our world, what we want in life. And here in the text, it's pride that will blind us from recognizing God's overtures in our life, suppressing the truth of what God wants us to see, and that's exactly where Pharaoh is right now. But secondly, notice that God tells Pharaoh that I've allowed you to remain so that my name may be declared in all the earth. I mean, Pharaoh has spent his entire life uh, having others serve his purposes, but now God informs Pharaoh Son, you're really created to serve my purposes. So notice what God does next. Verse 18, it says, Behold, uh, tomorrow, about this time, I will cause a heavy hail to rain down such that has not been in Egypt since the founding until now. Therefore, sin now and gather your livestock. And all that you have in the field, for the hail shall come on every man and every animal which is found in the field and is not brought home, and they shall die. Now, there's a play on words going on here in this verse. Notice, when God says, you shall cause, or he will cause a very heavy hail to rain down. Did you know that word heavy is exactly the same word used to describe Pharaoh's heart? In other words, God is saying to Pharaoh, Beware, the harshness of the hail is going to be in proportion to the hardness of your heart. And to remove any doubt that this might be a coincidence, God predicts the day and the time the hail will arrive. But what I want you to notice is that the people of Egypt, are they're starting to listen, even though Pharaoh, their leader, is not listening. Verse 20, it says, And he who fears the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and livestock flee to the houses. But he who did not regard the word of the Lord left his servants and livestock in the field. I mean, can you see what God is doing? He's extending grace to the people of Egypt. I mean, ten different times God will show His love and His patience 
for th- toward the Egyptians and toward Pharaoh, giving him one chance after another, after another, to change his mind and listen. But sadly, Pharaoh refuses to listen. And so the next day, Pharaoh steps outside, he raises one hand, and in the other hand he has a staff. And then suddenly the hell begins to fall from the air. And the thunder and lightning begin to strike the earth. And the hail strips the plants, the trees of their leaves. And anything that is left in the field is destroyed. Now you need to remember that the Egyptians, well, they believe their gods controlled the elements, the atmosphere. And this destructive hail... Well, it was a direct affront to the nut goddess. Remember, her, she bestowed blessings from the atmosphere as well as an affront to Isis and Seth who were responsible for growth and the maturity of the crops that are now destroyed. But did you notice in contrast, no hail was found in Goshen where the nation of Israel resided. And so what's Pharaoh's response this time? Well, look at verse 27. It says, And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and my people are, and I are wicked. Entreat the Lord that there may be no more mighty thundering and hail, for it is enough. And I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Wow. It seems like Pharaoh has seen the light, doesn't it? Well, Moses is not buying it. Look at the next verse. It says, And so Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city, I will spread out my hands and the Lord to the Lord, and the thunder will cease, and there will be no more hell, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you, you Pharaoh and your servants, I know you will not yet fear the Lord your God. I read a story about a young boy who was begging his dad this week. He said, Dad, let me do it. Let me do it. Please let me do it. I'll take full responsibility. I promise. Just let me do it. And the dad responded. He said, well, do you know that by taking full responsibility, you're saying that if anything goes wrong, you'll pay the consequences without complaint? That you'll make amends? And that you'll correct what happens By making sure what happens doesn't happen again? The son said, well, I don't agree to that. Not that. Well, what do you think taking full responsibility means, son? It just means saying, sorry. Now, that's the way Pharaoh is responding to God here in the text. Notice what he says. I have sinned this time. Really? Really? I mean, what makes this time different from all the other times? I mean, maybe it was the tone of voice, the way he said it, the look in his eye. I mean, for whatever reason, Moses knew Pharaoh wasn't being sincere. I mean, you ever done that? Admitted to God that you did something wrong? I mean, hoping that maybe by confessing it to God, you wouldn't have to pay the consequences of your bad decision? You know, there are three different ways that we can confess to God. I mean, the first, you could say, is an obligatory confession. It's not sincere at all. I mean, you're trying to get someone off your back so you can wiggle out of responsibility. That's the kind of confession the son was willing to offer to the dad. So there's the obligatory confession. But secondly, there's an insincere confession. Now, it may appear sincere on the surface, But the motives underneath are to get off the hook so you can just put the matter behind you. Now, it may not be a false confession. You may have sincere regret, but here is the key. It's not satisfying to the person receiving it. This is the kind of confession that Moses, I mean, that Pharaoh's offering to Moses. But there's a third kind of confession. This confession is a heartfelt confession. And this kind of confession uh, is about wanting to repair the connection so that the relationship can now function properly. Now, that's the kind of confession God wants from us when 
we realize our disobedience when we've done something wrong, when we've sinned. Now, Pharaoh, well, he offers an insincere confession, doesn't he? Look at verse 33. And so Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread out his hands to the Lord, and the thunder and hail ceased, and the rain was not poured on the earth. And then when Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more. He hardened his heart, he and his servants. And now did you notice that even though Pharaoh gave an insincere confession, God extends grace to him anyway. I mean, the grace that God extends to Pharaoh time and time again, did you know that's the same grace He extends to you and me? You see, God, He's interested far more than making the rela- in making the relationship right than just removing the sin. His longing, His heart is to remove the sin. Why? So that He might have intimacy with us. He can make the relationship right. You know, back in the 1960s, Billy Graham was driving through a sleepy southern town when he was stopped by a policeman and given a ticket for speeding. The policeman informed Graham that he had to go to the courthouse immediately and pay the fine. That's the way they did it in town. And he escorted Graham to the courthouse. When he entered the court, the judge hardly looked up. He just barked, how do you plead guilty, not guilty? Graham approached the bench. He said, I'm guilty, sir. He said, that'll be $100, $10 for every mile over the speed limit. And he hit the gavel on the bench. Then he looked up. He recognized the famous preacher. He wasn't sure what to do. There was an awkward pause. And then the judge said, Dr. Graham... You've broken the law. A penalty must be paid. And with that, the judge reached into his back pocket, pulled out his own wallet, took out a $100 bill, and attached it to the ticket and said, now it's paid in full. But this judge went one step further. With the penalty taken care of and moved out of the way, he looked Dr. Graham in the eye and said, And sir, would you dine with me this evening? Do you know that's exactly what God has done for us? He has taken the perfection of Christ and credited it to our account. Our fine has been paid in full. Now, with that taken out of the way, With the penalty removed, he's looking each of us in the eye and he's saying, will you dine with me? You know, that's one of the reasons communion is so important. It's a time for us as Christ followers to pause and to reflect. To see if there's anything that might have come in between your, you and your relationship with God that could cause your hearts to harden. I mean, that's the reason when Paul wrote the church at Corinth, he said this, But let a man examine himself, and then let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. And so, as the host team comes forward to receive the elements, I want to give you time to pause and to reflect. See if there's anything that's come between you and your relationship with God. And if so, you can remove it by confessing it. Repair the connection so the relationship can function properly. And then we'll take those elements together.